Kyle, thank you very much. I trust you can see the screen and I trust that you can hear me. And if, if either one of those is incorrect, I trust you'll let me know. Um, so uh, this, is, this is my um, opening slide, which of course has some x-ray patterns on it. And again, the, the topic of today's talk is uh, quantifying domain wall contributions to properties using x-rays. And it's a real pleasure to contribute this to the Faro Talks webinar, which was a product of this unfortunate pandemic that we're in, but a really great experiment that we're undertaking. Um, all right, so the intended audience of this talk is anyone interested in physical properties of polycrystalline ferroelectric materials and anyone who holds some basic understanding of x-ray diffraction. So there's simply not enough time to go into all of the possibilities of applying x-ray and neutron scattering techniques to ferroelectrics. There's a lot of things that you can learn. So we're gonna pick one specific thing. Kyle said that we should have specific things. So I invite you on a journey down the metaphorical rabbit hole. And if you don't know what a rabbit hole is, it's a metaphor for beginning a journey that's particularly difficult, complex, or chaotic, especially one that becomes increasingly so as it unfolds. And today's rabbit hole involves three equations. The first two, which will allow us to calculate the degree of domain wall motion in ferroelectric polycrystal materials. And then the third, which allows us to take those calculated values and determine the macroscopic strain. Now, you may ask, why these equations? And in particular, why this third equation? Uh, I jokingly said on a social media platform last year when I pasted this equation that this could possibly be one of my greatest contributions to science. Now, that either means that I've not done enough or it means that it was helpful, and I hope that time will tell that it's helpful. So an outline of the talk is shown here. Part one, x-ray quantification of domain switching. Part two, will introduce orientations and texture. Part three will connect these microscopic phenomena with macroscopic properties. And part four, given time, we'll have a few additional points of inspiration. So let's go ahead and get started. And in the background here of this introductory slide for part one, I put an optical uh, microscopy image of a single crystal that I grew and characterized uh, during my graduate days. So the motivation for this work is that we know domain wall contributions exist to piezoelectric, ferroelectric, dielectric, and elastic properties. And this has been known for a very long time. One of my favorite papers on this was in 1991 by Eric Cross and colleagues, where they said the piezoelectric effect consists of two parts, the intrinsic and the extrinsic piezo effects. The extrinsic effect represents the elastic deformation caused by the motions of non 180 degree domain walls. And studies show that the extrinsic effect contributes 60 to 70% of the piezo moduli observed experimentally. And then later on during my postdoctoral days, I read this great paper from Dragan Damjanovic, a feature article in the Journal of the American Ceramic Society, which says that interestingly, there's very little direct experimental evidence of the contribution of domain walls or interface boundaries to the dielectric or piezoelectric response. On the other hand, many models assume the displacement of domain walls to be the main mechanism for the weak field frequency dispersion hysteresis and nonlinearity. And so if you draw some simple schematics, you can get an appreciation for what the intrinsic effect may look like for piezoelectricity, and then also how the extrinsic effect may also contribute to macroscopic strain. If you change the volume fractions of these respective domains, you get a net effect um, on macroscopic strain. And I like to draw this uh, a little bit more from a microstructural perspective uh, in this schematic. And what we're going to do is we're going to um, apply increasing amounts of electric field and move these domain walls and see how it tracks against the strain uh, field hysteresis loop. And so with a little bit of electric field, not much happens. But as soon as you apply an electric field beyond the coercive field, most folks on the call know that you get ferroelectric switching. And this is a large amount of ferroelectric switching to the point where when you look at the microstructure, you have a very significant uh, degree of domain reorientation. And then if you release the electric field and come back to the remnant state, you also have a preferred orientation in these domain structures. And what you can do is cycle it about weak fields and also appreciate that these domain walls continue to move and continue to contribute to properties. So in thinking about x-rays and how x-rays can be useful in characterizing these particular effects, um, it's easy to see that x-ray diffraction provides a couple peaks that provide an indicator for the volume fraction of these different domain variants that you might be wanting to measure. 
And so you could think about applying very large bipolar, uh, high field cycling, and tracking using X-ray diffraction, how the peak intensities change. You could also think about applying strong DC fields like you'd see in electrical polling of piezo ceramics. And you can see significant changes in the relative intensities and the emergence of new reflections in these situations. You can also think about taking a polled material and then applying weak unipolar or bipolar fields, similar to what would be measured during property coefficients. Okay. And then as a function of field amplitude, cycle number, et cetera, you can study things like aging and contributions to Rayleigh behavior. So there's broad potential application of x-rays for studying these types of phenomena. But we have a need for quantification. We can appreciate that in an initially unpolled sample, you might have a relative intensity ratio that's proportional to the structure factors and the multiplicities. And you may appreciate that under an extremely polled condition, you could have one peak take that full intensity and the other peak go to essentially zero. But in most cases in these materials, we have a situation like this, where we have incomplete polling. And so we need a method to take these two intensities and learn something about the volume fraction of the material that switched. So I was inspired as a graduate student from a couple different directions. And one was from reading the literature as all graduate students should do. And as I dug through the literature, I kept digging back and back and back in time. And I finally got to this paper, 1957, out of Penn State, Domain Effects in Polycrystalline Barium Titanate. And there was a corresponding dissertation that's also very useful to read. And here what they did is they said, let's just look at the intensity ratio as a function of applying a tensile stress, or analogously an electric field, and a compressive stress. And you can very easily and readily see that the intensity ratio changes as a function of positive and negative stresses. And so the authors go through and create a very nice way of describing the fraction of domains that have switched. And then in later work, for example, this paper in 2000 by Bedoya, uh, they take yet another approach for describing the fractions of domains that are switched. Now we're not gonna dig into these two equations today because that would take an hour in and of itself. But mainly I want to point to the fact that in this community, there's a tendency to talk about the fraction of these domains that have switched or the volume fraction that switched. Now, I grew up in a research uh, group that was led by an advisor, Keith Bowman, who was an expert in crystallographic texture. And so we talked a lot about texture and anisotropy. And I purchased this book uh, back before all of these books were available online. And I still use this book today um, to learn something about texture. And a definition of texture is down here, a non-random distribution of crystallographic orientations in a polycrystalline aggregate. And when you're dealing in texture, you want to describe pole densities or orientation densities that have the unit multiples of a random distribution, or MRD. And so he had published a couple papers on this uh, earlier, this one, for example, from 2000, where they actually measured full pole figures for textures, both from polling and cross-polling in the tetragonal PZT. And so what you see on these pole figures is you see numbers that represent the pole densities in this unit multiple of a random distribution, again describing the degree to which the domains have reoriented. Okay. Now, what I did early on as a graduate student is I tried to marry these two concepts. And so we ended up publishing my first paper on this topic, which I believe is really a unified description of domain switching. So we take this idea that we can describe these uh, switched volume fractions and also describe it as a multiple of a random distribution. And so I was very happy as a, as a freshly minted PhD student to publish this paper. Um, the most relevant text here is highlighted. The X-ray diffraction approach uses the relative intensity ratio of ferroelectric poles in polled and unpolled PZT to calculate a domain switching fraction, which we're representing as eta, or a multiple of a random distribution, or MRD, and we show them to be linearly related. So the first two equations in this rabbit hole are shown here. We're not gonna derive these today because again, that could be an hour in and of itself. And so you can go to the paper and you can learn about these derivations. Some important take home, uh, take home points. These equations use the initial unpolled intensities which should be comparable in a randomly oriented sample to the powder intensities or the intensities you take off of a PDF card. 
Okay. And then we take the intensity of the OO2 and the 2OO for tetragonal, for example, and we calculate the degree of domain switching that's occurred in a particular direction of the sample. Equivalently, you can take that same base equation and calculate the multiple of a random distribution. And you can readily see from these two equations that they're correlated. Okay? Now this example is for the tetragonal material, but we wrote analogous equations for a lot of other symmetries in subsequent papers. All right, so what does this provide us? I showed this schematic earlier. This is for an initially unpolled sample. And here we can say that the degree of domain switched is zero and that the pole density of the polar axis is one multiple multiples of a random distribution. So it's equal to random. Okay? And if we apply some electric field, we can generate domain wall motion and we can increase the volume fraction of the pink domain at the expense of the blue domain. And then our switching fraction increases to somewhere between one and 67% and the multiple of a random somewhere between one and three. And then in the fully polled, completely saturated case, you can see that the domain switching fraction is 67%. So what this means is that 67% of the material, this blue, has now turned to pink, okay? Or equivalently, the F002 is three multiples of a random distribution. So we have three times the amount of these orientations relative to what we saw in a randomly oriented sample. All right. So an important consequence, this is not an arbitrary, uh, an arbitrary equation, an important consequence of this equation um, and the fact that it's quantitative with domain volume fractions or MRDs is that it enables us to relate these quantities to macroscopic strain, as we'll show in the subsequent sections of this talk. And I'd like to emphasize that in contrast, simple intensity ratios like taking the OO2 or over 200 do not enable this linkage to macroscopic strain. And so that's one of the values of these types of descriptors. Let me show you a few examples of how this is useful. There's a phase diagram uh, of BZT-BCT here, um, one of the leading um, material systems being discussed in lead free research. And we've done several um, experiments on compositions throughout this phase diagram, but the one I want to share with you today is represented by the star in that location um, of temperature and composition. If we take one of these compositions, which is tetragonal and not at the MPD, but close to the MPD, and we apply uh, increasing electric fields, you can see in the raw data that we have an intensity interchange between the 002 and the 200 very clearly, right? You can fit those peaks, another topic that we're not gonna talk about today, but could be the subject of another hour long seminar. You can fit those peaks, extract the intensities and calculate these metrics. And you can represent them on a plot of pole density, F002, or domain switching fraction, eta, as a function of electric field amplitude. And here you're seeing two measurements. The red data represents the the scattering vector parallel to the electric field. And we can see that we start out in the initial unpolled state. MRD is one and the switching fraction is zero. And as we apply an electric field, you can see that this indicator increases, showing you that the domains are aligning on a volume fraction basis with the applied electric field. And the overall shape of this mimics the hysteresis loop, which you might expect. I had a postdoc join my group once who said, I can make nano-grained barium titanate. And I said, barium titanate has been studied for 60 years and I don't think we should do any experiments. And he said, but I can make nano-crystalline barium titanate. And I said, okay, okay, let's do it. So he made some really nice barium titanate uh, ceramics and we deployed these types of uh, analytical approaches to describing the degree of domain switching in this set of samples. Now, one thing to, to really remember about barium titanate is that around a grain size of one or two microns, there's a peak in properties. And throughout decades of literature, there are various theories about why there's an increase to properties. And we thought these tools would be useful uh, for characterizing this. And so if we take this material at a very high grain size and apply uh, high electric fields, you can see significant amounts of intensity interchange between say the positive state identified here and the zero state identified here. 
Now, you can study this as a function of grain size. And so over here, the smaller grain size, you can see that the intensity ratio is also um, significant. But one of the things that you see at the intermediate grain size is that the intensity interchange is more than observed in these other two samples. So this was the high field uh, experiment. We also did a weak field experiment. And without getting into too many more details that go beyond one slide, if you plot the degree of domain switching, eta, as a function of grain size, you can see that it maximizes at this intermediate grain size. And so we hoped that this contribution would add value to domain wall motion being one of the most important contributors to this high response. We've been collaborating for several years with the Susan Trawler and McKinstry group at Penn State um, under uh, an NSF, a collaborative NSF project, and we deployed these techniques on thin film PZT. And so here you can see a schematic representing a small incident angle on an electrode and a diffraction pattern shown up here. Um, as we apply voltage to the sample, you can see representative intensity interchanges between the 100 and the 001 peak. Now, we studied a variety of different samples. Shown here first are samples that are mechanically declamped through etching. And if we use this indicator, eta, as a metric to describe how much domain switching we have as a function of voltage, you can see that as the degree of declamping increases, up to 75% declamped, that we're allowing more domain reorientation. So hopefully that demonstrates the value of this to thin films. We also investigated porous and dense PZT thin films, and you can see that the purposeful introduction of porosity also allows you to substantially increase the degree of domain switching that you're seeing. Example four is a rhombohedral perovskite structured bismuth ferrite sample. And this is a sample that comes out of uh, today, uh, Rohox Group, uh, Josef Stefan Institute. And they worked on this material for quite some time. And one of the interesting physical properties that they observed is that the tan delta, or uh, the, the piezoelectric phase angle, becomes negative at particular frequencies. And they wanted to understand the different mechanisms contributing to that negative piezoelectric phase angle. And so the John Daniels group um, with uh, Alicia Liu at UNSW then took these samples and applied these same types of uh, experiments. And so you can see a representation of the 111 peak splitting in this rhombohedral based material. And they're applying a sinusoidal electric field and they're tracking F111. So this is the multiple of a random distribution of the polar 111 direction as a function of time and electric field amplitude. And they're able to show that the degree of orientation changes and follows the electric field signal. And they extract this delta F parameter to describe the extent of how much that varies throughout that sinusoidal waveform. And then over here, you can see the result of this, which is delta F111 being plotted on this axis as the blue diamonds. And you can see that as you increase frequency, the contribution of domain walls decrease, consistent with the expectation. Now, section two orientations and texture. I want to emphasize the importance of orientation space, in particular for polycrystalline materials. If you just do the types of measurements that we've looked at so far, you're only sampling one scattering vector in your sample. But this talk is dedicated to polycrystalline materials of all types, where we want to measure the scattering vector in all orientations of the sample. And so you could approach this from a pole figure perspective where you have two dimensions, like shown in that cross polling paper I referenced before, those two dimensions being alpha and beta. And you could consider instead of just selecting one orientation, we might be able to, to measure the entire pole figure. And that would provide more value to the types of things that we want to characterize. If you take it one step further, you could characterize it in terms of an orientation distribution function or ODF. And in that case, you would describe all possible crystal orientations using three dimensions, here represented as the three Euler angles. Right? These three angles can describe the orientation of any crystallite with respect to a reference frame. One can define the collection of these angles as the orientation lowercase g. And the frequency 
of any orientation existing in a sample is described in the units, again, of multiples of a random distribution. And so from this, you could create an orientation distribution function that captures the pole or orientation densities as a function of G. Okay? We're not going to do that today because uh, it's an intensive process, but it's one that I think is very valuable. Now, an important takeaway from looking at pole figures and looking at domain switching is that the total intensity of the 002 and 200 is conserved in all scattering directions. And this provides significant value to us. Now, I tried to illustrate this in a schematic that I threw together this morning, so I hope it comes across well. You could imagine, and again, this is a highly simplified schematic, so I've got the disclaimer down here at the bottom. You could imagine that with applied electric field, you could reorient some of these domains into a more favorable direction. But if you're looking at either a G vector here, or here, or here, you can see that domain reorientation is conserved if you consider the total intensity of both. Now, the implication of this is that domain rearrangement can be described in a single pole figure. What this means is that we don't have to calculate the orientation distribution function. We can, but we could just sample um, scattering vectors as a function of, of space in our pole figure. Okay. So here's some raw data showing that. This, again, is the 002 and the 200 peak of a tetragonal PZT sample um, as a function of angle to the electric field, shown over here. Okay. Now, if you fit all of these diffraction peaks and you calculate the degree of domain switching, you can represent that as a pole figure. So here I have a pole figure for this material, tetragonal PZT, MRD on the left y-axis, eta on the right y-axis. Again, you can calculate one from the other. And we're representing data here as a function of angle to the electric field direction. So this is the first pole figure that we see today because it describes the crystallographic texture or preferred orientation of the 002 pole as a function of angle to the electric field. Now, there's a couple different techniques we use to create this pole figure. We did a couple neutron scattering experiments and calculated the full ODF. Those are represented as lines. And then we did some X-ray experiments in reflection. So we used a, a low energy X-ray source, and so we could only get over to a certain amount, but you can see that both measurements are, are fairly comparable. So nowadays we do uh, what I would say are more robust measurements, and many groups across the world do these types of robust measurements. So typically we use a high energy uh, X-ray source produced uh, from a synchrotron. We'll put our sample in the synchrotron beam. The high energies allow the collapse of these cones to very small angles. And on a two-dimensional detector, you can capture the Debye share rings. Now, the important thing to note here is that in the vertical direction of the detector, you have information from scattering that represents uh, scattering vectors approximately parallel to the electric field direction. And perpendicular, you have information in the scattering pattern from scattering vectors that are approximately perpendicular to the electric field. So if you look at the raw data, you can see that, for example, again, sticking to the tetragonal case, you can see a change in intensity of the 002 and 200 peak as a function of angle. And here we're representing the angle as a sector. So we're discretizing what was formerly a continuous distribution of intensity. So what does this look like? Well, again, raw data looks something like this. If you fit the peaks and do these calculations, you can create pole figures. Here, represented on, on the y-axis is the multiple of a random distribution of the 002 pole as a function of angle. And in this particular example, we were applying an increasing field amplitude. And so you can see the evolution of these pole densities as a function of electric field and angle. Okay. Now, this plot also introduces this idea that we know the maximum value of possible uh, domain orientations and the pole figure that represents that. Okay. So again, as a grad student, I was playing around in MATLAB and I decided that I wanted to model this type of phenomena, okay? the situation where 
all of the domains aligned to the fullest possible extent. And so going back to this simplified schematic that I was showing before, you could consider a situation where every single possible orientation reorients to the most favorable one, okay? Now that's a very simple switching model and a mechanics person would probably laugh at it, but it's very useful for describing the orientation dependence of some of these uh, effects. And so we built this model using about 200,000 random crystal orientations. Uh, we implemented this switching criteria, which determines the most favorable degenerate axis relative to the field or stress direction. And we started getting some interesting results. So the paper that uh, reported it is, is shown here. Um, I show an inverse pole figure, which represents uh, the different types of crystallographic directions that are parallel to a sample direction. And so this one in part A is parallel to the electric field direction. So in a fully polled or fully saturated case, these are the possible crystal directions that you would have represented parallel to the electric field. Now, one needs to build confidence if you create models. And again, there's a thread of uh, literature that informs what we're doing. And this one in particular was, was very nice. 1963, a paper by uh, Redden in Journal of Applied Physics. And here you have complete analytical solutions to this, okay? Now on the left-hand side, you're seeing our representation of the saturated pole figures for complete switching for the rhombohedral and tetragonal case compared to the equivalent ones calculated in this earlier paper, okay? So this brings a, a bring some confidence into the types of uh, results that we're getting. So now we know that we have a, a saturated case, okay? And now we know that we have real domain textures in different types of materials. And so a natural question is how close to saturation is possible? And I would say based on experience for most uh, single phase polycrystal materials, it's difficult to get up here to values of two or 2.5. But we have seen in many cases in mixed phase systems where two polymorphic phases coexist that you can have a significant amount of domain reorientation. And that example is shown here for bismuth, uh, nickel, titanate, lead titanate. So let's connect this microscopic phenomena with macroscopic strain. So there are two things to note. The contribution of domain reorientation to macroscopic strain must be a function of the lattice aspect ratio or the spontaneous strain, and it must be a function of the extent of domain switching. And so generally, this is the type of function we might expect. But in a polycrystalline material, we have other orientations. And so we need to uh, account for their contributions to the macroscopic strain. And those of you that are familiar with tensors would appreciate that if you rotate or project a second rank tensor, there's a cosine squared term. And so this cosine squared term allows you to project the strain into the vertical direction. And so now we appreciate that this delta L of a polycrystalline sample is a function of the spontaneous strain, the degree of domain switching, and cosine squared alpha. So back to textbooks. How do you connect microscopics with macroscopics? Well, in this texture book that I mentioned before, there's a very interesting chapter on grain averaging. And I just pulled out a couple representative equations from this. The first one in this chapter shows you the volume average of a tensorial quantity T of X as a function of position X in the sample. Position, right? Traversing through the sample, you can imagine that if you average positionally, you could get the average effect in a polycrystalline aggregate. Okay. But texture researchers extend this to doing an integral over orientation space. And so here the volume integral shown above can be transformed into an integral defined over the domain of the orientation angles, okay? which as we said before is this lowercase g. So we're integrating over all of the orientations. Now, what does this mean for us? We mentioned that these other orientations contribute to strain and we must account for that somehow. And so these two terms shown in this fundamental texture equation represent F of G, which is the orientation density. How strong is that orientation density? And T of G, the property being averaged. And in that, in that case, for us, 
It's the spontaneous strain multiplied by cosine squared of alpha. Okay. So pulling all this together, we were able to create that important equation. We published it in this paper, and we calculated the saturated strains that would result from uh, three different crystal systems. Okay. So the strain equation that I showed early, that I called a rabbit hole, is here. The domain switching strains are calculated exclusively from the pole figures. An integral is formulated analogous to the general physical properties that we showed on the previous slide using this volume weighted average of single crystal distortions over the entire orientation space G. Okay. Now we took this one step further because if I use the chat box and I, I polled you and I said, you know what G is, I'm sure that only a few of you would know what G is. So in the paper, uh, we, we got rid of one of the Euler angles and we reduced this to two angles, alpha and beta, which represent the pole figure uh, directions. Okay. So we could simplify this even further. And in most of the subsequent papers that we've published using this approach, we have simplified it further. And we've represented it using a single integral over alpha, because in most cases, not all, but most, we have a uniaxial pole figure, or in other words, a fiber texture. And so we're not interested in beta. And so the strain resulting from switching can be described according to this equation. Under very weak fields, the contribution to strain can be expressed as the contribution to the piezoelectric effect. And so here's a third connection point, right? First, we calculated the degree of switching. Then we calculated how that influenced macroscopic strain. And if we do it at weak fields, we could determine the contribution to the piezo coefficient from that mechanism. All right. How do we implement it? Well, here's the equation repeated up here at the top. Now, I apologize. In early papers, I should have written these equations out explicitly. It turns out that as a student, you know, doing your work and, and reading this equation, it's, it's difficult to figure out how to implement this for discretized data such as the data that we showed down here as a function of sector. And so uh, the equations to do that are shown up here. And again, this is from thinking about the integral as well as referencing these fundamental texture books. Okay? So this is a summation from I equals one to N of different types of contributions from all of these different sectors. Okay? And you can represent this as a function of F or as a function of eta. All right. Now, the other piece of valued information I'd add to this is this cosine alpha minus cosine alpha term accounts for this solid angle of that sector, which was captured up here in the integral as the sine alpha. Okay. Now, don't worry too much if you don't understand all this, because I have a spreadsheet that can describe how to do it. And in fact, I've sent this spreadsheet to several of you on the call, as well as several others, as you're working through some of these calculations. And we know that this calculation is right, um, again, for one reason, because we calculated the maximum strain possible in a tetragonal perovskite crystal as 37% of the single crystal strain. And that matches values in Jaffe and some other similar uh, publications. Okay, so I'm happy to share this with anyone that really wants to dive down an even deeper rabbit hole on this topic. But I'm gonna come back up for a second. I don't wanna dive any deeper down that rabbit hole. For tetragonal PZT, the macroscopic strain after polling or the polling strain can be largely explained by the strain from domain reorientation. And so I think one of the first applications of this was taking this data that I showed you before and calculating as a function of polling field, the strain resulting from switching. So this red curve over here on the right is directly calculated from these pole figures shown over here. Okay. And that well explains the polling strain at low electric fields. And then at high electric fields, you have other effects um, that also come into play. In a second example, I go back to this BZT, BCT example. And in this material, the raw data over here on the left was shown before. And although I didn't show you on the previous slide, we actually measured the degree of domain switching as a function of angle to the electric field. And that data is represented here in this middle plot. Once again, we have F on one axis and eta on the other because they're related. Now, if we take this data and calculate the net effect of switching to the macroscopic strain, 
we can see the macroscopic strain plotted over here as the red line, and then the contribution from domain switching as the black line. And so in this material, that's not exactly at the MPB, but it's compositionally close to the MPB, we see a significant contribution of switching to the macroscopic strain. Another example from uh, early on in our, our work on lead-free materials, this is sodium bismuth titanate, barium titanate, the phase diagram of which is shown over here. Um, this material at room temperature exhibits the highest piezoelectric coefficient at about six or seven percent barium titanate. Um, in collaborations with John Daniels, uh, we were able to show that the material is initially uh, cubic, and then as we apply an electric field, we generate a tetragonal crystal structure. So there's some sort of field-induced phase transition going on. And one question is, as we trace the hysteresis loop of this particular material, how much of this strain is due to the phase transformation or phase transition, and how much of it is due to the alignment of domains in the tetragonal phase? And again, without going into too much detail, which would go beyond one slide, I show you this calculation at the bottom, which is calculated using the methods described on the prior slides. Example four, and I think maybe the most exciting example for me, is the extension of this idea to applying weak fields to polycrystalline ferroelectric samples. So now we're going to start in a polled state. We're going to take an unpolled sample and poll it, just like we've seen before, but then we're going to cycle it in that polled state under weak AC fields. And those AC fields could be square waves, they could be sine waves. You know, that's not the purpose of today's conversation. The purpose is that it's weak. And when we do these types of measurements, you can see measurable changes in the intensities. You may have to count for a long time, okay, or use a very high intensity source, but you can see changes in intensities under those weak field conditions. And so we represent that again as a pole figure. Here's eta on the y-axis. This is the unpolled reference state, okay? The polled state is shown as the black line. That's the domain texture in the polled state. And when we're at the pulled state, we're going to cycle it under these weak electric fields. So I'm going to represent that here on the top right figure as electric field versus time, and then animate this down here to show you as you apply a positive and negative state to your pulled sample, you're actually generating a change in the texture. Okay. Now we represent that on this top plot as delta eta. So again, polling takes you from unpolled to the gray line, and then cycling it allows you to go between these two states. Okay? The difference between those two states is the strain that you want. Okay? So that value is important. And now if we do this strain calculation for the deltas, the deltas between the positive and negative states, we can calculate the contribution to strain under weak field conditions. Right. So, the first time we applied this was to tetragonal PZT near the morphotropic phase boundary. The macroscopic strain under certain conditions is shown here. It correlates to a D33 of about 400. Some of the, the scattering data is shown over here on the left where you can readily see changes in relative intensity ratios. Over here on the right, you can see the relative intensity ratio under positive and negative electric fields and it changes. And then once again, the change at the polled state, the change between the positive and negative states, delta eta. Okay. So doing that strain calculation allows you to determine that about 30 or 40 percent of that uh, macroscopic strain is due to uh, domain contributions, with the other contributions being piezoelectric, elastic, and etc. Right. Example five is the work of one of my first PhD students, Abhijit Pramanik. So we decided that based upon the work on the previous slide, we should expand this a little further into other compositions, and in particular, study the Rayleigh behavior. So the change in the piezoelectric coefficient as a function of field amplitude. And so we took uh, piezoelectric coefficient data in collaboration with Dragan Damjanovic, and then we did these X-ray experiments, and we calculated the contribution from 90 degree domain wall motion to that macroscopic piezoelectric coefficient. You can break that down even further and you can look at the linear and nonlinear contributions. And we're not going to dive too much more deeply into this, but I'd encourage you to read the paper if it's of interest to you. The main messages are that only about 200 
of this macroscopic coefficient comes from the intrinsic piezoelectric effect, and about 50% of the coefficient resulted directly from these extrinsic or domain wall contributions. So we do have a little bit of time, and so I will put in a, a few additional points of inspiration. Uh, in the backdrop here, I show a photograph of Purdue University, the location where this first additional point of inspiration came from. So this is actually my, my graduate work. We were working on texturing of ceramic materials uh, through a process called tape casting. And when you tape cast materials uh, with seeds or templates, you can generate a macroscopic crystallographic texture in your sample. And that's shown schematically uh, down here. Okay. Now, in this case, the initial material has an initial texture, and that's represented as this pole figure here. Okay. So the possible polar axes are oriented in the plane of the sample. Okay. Now, what we're going to do is, is we're going to take a cut from the sample and apply a field in the plane of this sample and then characterize the field-induced switching effects. So the application of fields causes switching on top of the initial texture. Okay? And that switching can be represented over here as eta, the degree of switching, ferroelectric switching that has occurred. Okay? Now I described the first one as the processing effectiveness. How well does the tape casting technique produce a strong texture? And over here, the polling effectiveness. How effective is the electric field at generating uh, switching in the sample? Okay? Now, at the end, you've oriented domains via both grain engineering and domain texturing. Okay? So the complete description of field-induced texture can be shown um, as a third, third pole figure. Okay? And this is the true texture representation. All right, another neat example comes from our work on monitoring of de-aging. And uh, I realize uh, most folks on the call are probably not familiar with this concept of de-aging. Uh, a definition for it is shown here. Irreversible change in property coefficients due to application of small alternating fields, uh, typically within the time frame of the experiment. I think a great example of a de-aging effect uh, comes out of uh, Taylor and Damjanovic, uh, 1998. The macroscopic hysteresis loop of a thin film is shown here. And what they've done is they've applied electric fields at weak electric field amplitudes to study permittivity effects. And so if you start your measurement here and increase your amplitude of electric field, you go up the bottom line. And then as you come back down, you come down a different line. So you have a different domain state, okay? And that's evidence of de-aging. And so we took a material bismuth scandate lead titanate and we first polled it as shown down here. So you can see characteristic intensity changes associated with polling. And then in the polled state, we applied a cyclic electric field. And so here's the positive state of the electric field. Here's the negative state of the electric field. And through the equations that we showed earlier, you can calculate eta 002 and eta uh, 002 in the positive and negative directions. Okay. Now, we did this experiment under progressively increasing electric fields, similar to the upward trend on the data on the previous slide. And you can plot the difference between these two as an indicator of the extent of domain wall motion in the polled state. So this is delta A to 002 as a function of electric field, uh, electric field amplitude. And if you start looking at this data, you might get excited because it increases as a function of field amplitude. And those familiar with Rayleigh law may suggest fitting it different parts of this to a line. Okay? But there's an interesting effect that's not captured in this type of representation. And that is the absolute value of eta. Okay? So the absolute value of eta in the positive, uh, during the positive field is shown here, and during the negative field is shown here. And what you're seeing on average is a decrease in the degree of polling while you're cycling the sample. Okay, so I like to describe this in the following way. If you're on a train rolling slightly downhill and you're running forward and backward, the running of forward, forward and backward is this but you're not really accounting for the effect that the train is rolling downhill. So this is a, a quantitative description of this de-aging effect. We interpreted this in the paper in terms of an energy landscape. So you can imagine a domain wall going over energy barriers. And we suggested that the initial measurements occurred in a polled state where domain walls were pushed up against very large pinning centers. And so you could imagine cycling between this positive and this negative eta value. 
But then later, you've backwardly moved on average to a lower state on this energy curve and that your later measurements, while larger in delta eta, are also on average a little bit less um, of a polled state. And so we found that de-aging due to weakening of polled domain textures during weak AC fields. Um, and then we also said that this is analogous to the Bauschinger effect in metals, which was a nice uh, parallel between metals and ceramics. And so uh, just for inspiration for the grad students, when we first submitted this to the journal for review, um, the reviewers came back and they said, well, this, this really isn't physical review letter quality because it doesn't have enough math. And so what we did in the revision process was we fit this eta D, this de-aging curve to a line, and we created this equation and we called this a de-aging coefficient. <laughs> and so that satisfied the reviewers. All right, there's another rabbit hole we're not gonna go down today, um, but I just wanna introduce it uh, for completeness. And that is the thought that you can connect these types of measurements also um, of domain textures to polarization and then by extension also to permittivity. And so you can find a couple papers in the literature that describe that. These equations uh, are outlined uh, in this first paper on the topic. Uh, we once again did saturated polling models for the polarization textures. And then we applied it several years later to barium titanate to calculate the contribution of domain reversal to the dielectric permittivity in barium titanate, and we showed it to be about 70%. All right. Ah, I do have one more thing. You may be able to do some of this in your lab. In a project sponsored by the Center for Dielectrics and Piezoelectrics and carried out in our analytical instrumentation facility here at NC State, we developed an in-situ loading cell where we can apply electric fields to thin films and to polycrystalline samples at room temperatures and also at elevated temperatures. And so uh, you, um, anyone watching this call actually has access to do experiments um, using this type of setup in this open access facility. Representative data is shown here. Laboratory data for a given sample matches well the synchrotron data. It's a bit more noisy, but you don't have to travel to a synchrotron and you can do it during a pandemic. And then what we plot over here is delta eta as a function of temperature. So you can see the extent of switching in this particular sample increases with temperature as you'd expect. And then we fit it to determine an activation energy. I need to acknowledge a whole long list of people. So first of all, the emphasis on texture um, and scientific communication from my advisors, Keith Bowman and Elliot Slamovich. Uh, former postdocs and graduate students that all played a role in these types of uh, these types of contributions. Uh, my current graduate students that suffer through uh, these types of rabbit hole descriptions with me from time to time. Too many undergrad students to list on one slide and a long list of collaborators including but not limited to the ones listed here and funding from the National Science Foundation. So thank you very much and I'll turn the floor back over to